Hey everyone, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Lacey Hildebrand. I'm the manager of the Carbondale Branch Library, part of Garfield County Public Library District here in Western Colorado. Um, I'll be leading our conversation this evening. I'm also joined by Alex Garcia Bernal. He's our events manager. He will be managing any questions that you may have throughout the presentation. And he can also be as of help with any technical questions in the chat box. Um, and we'll do our best. <laughs> um, we will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the conversation with Dr. Kimmerer. Um, and you can submit those questions to Alex as part of that. Uh, and I'll make sure to pause uh, as we're nearing the end of our conversation, just to remind everybody, you know, hey, if you wanna get involved, now's the time. Um, so without much more, uh, let's get started. Um, so we're joined this evening by uh, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, her books include Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, which we'll be discussing this evening, uh, and Gathering Moss, which was awarded the John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing. Uh, she's the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, and a distinguished teaching professor of environmental biology at the Southern University of New York. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kimmerer. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm gonna thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna let you jump in, uh, kind of get this conversation going. Did you have some any opening remarks or? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, I think I will begin as um, I always do, which is our traditional Potawatomi protocol greeting. So a little bit of our language. I don't speak much of our language, but. Um, um, we're asked to, to use it whenever we can. So I'll say to you, bonjour, which is our respectful greeting. Shabadas ke gish kokwe nadeshnakas. Bodwe wadmi kwenda, megaze do dem, minwa mako do dem. Shishibanya knebende gwes. Mekwech, kinege kokamijang. I've told you that my name, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, is. Uh, light shining through Sky Woman. I am a Potawatomi, Anishinaabe woman, and a member of the Bear Clan and also of the Eagles. Um, I'm enrolled in um, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation in Oklahoma, and I'm so grateful to be here with you. And I want to tell you that um, I'm speaking to you tonight. Um, what fun. I always love to speak to libraries, you know, full of readers, fellow readers. And uh, where, where I am reading these this winter is at my home in upstate New York. Um, I live sort of at the edge of the Finger Lakes in what I think of as the heart of Maple Nation. This is, in fact, just over my back hill is uh, the uh, territory of the Onondaga Nation. And I'm really grateful to have my Haudenosaunee Onondaga neighbors here um, to whom we owe a debt of land and history and, and certainly of, of knowledge and philosophy of caring for, for Mother Earth. And I'm, I'm really grateful to be in the company of my, of my friends and, and neighbors here. Um, I also brought with me, of course, sweetgrass, since we're talking about sweetgrass uh, tonight. And I imagine maybe some of you have read the book, probably a lot of you not. And um, so I wanted to introduce you. Um, this plant that you see here in a braid is the uh, plant that gives name to the book Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, our name for this plant in our language is Wingashk. And, and Wingashk in our, in our language does mm, refer to this sweet smelling grass. It smells kind of like uh, vanilla, like a mix of honey and, and vanilla. Um, and um, it also refers to the meadows that it grows in. And um, there is sweet grass in Colorado, in, in the high plains, I know. Um, so, so maybe you know this plant too, at least by, by her fragrance. And we all, you almost always see it uh, braided like this. And that braid is, um, the reason that we braid it is that we think about wingosh or sweetgrass in our creation stories as the um, hair of Mother Earth. It's said to be one of the first plants to grow on Mother Earth. So it is her hair. And, you know, 
when we braid each other's hair, that's that sign of, of real care for one another, right? Care for your health and beauty and, 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 and wellness. And, and so that's what we're doing when we braid sweetgrass is to honor Mother Earth by, by braiding her hair. And that notion of the sweetgrass being the first on, on Mother Earth, of being a healing plant, it's one of our sacred plants, um, is also true in the scientific realm. I'm a botanist. I'm a plant ecologist by training. And um, I study disturbance and restoration. And sure enough, sweetgrass is a healer of the land. It's one of those plants that comes in after soil disturbance. It's rhizomatous, it binds up the land, it literally heals the land. And so this is an example of the way that, that traditional philosophy and teachings align with, with, uh, with ecology, with the natural world. And um, so I, I like to see that convergence the other thing to know about this braid pertinent to the book is that there's a lot of teachings about what those three strands mean. And the way that I use this as a metaphor in the book is that those three strands of knowledge are, for one, scientific knowledge, plant knowledge, um, um, again, that I practice as a professor of, of plant ecology. Um, but it also is a strand of traditional knowledge, of indigenous knowledge of, of plants and how to care for them. And you say, all right, well, what's the third strand? Um, both Western science and indigenous science are human knowledge. They're the knowledge that, that we are trying to make sense of. But what's the source of that knowledge? The land, the plant, not the plants themselves. And so we honor that knowledge as well. And the third strand is the stories of the plants themselves and, and their teachings. And so the stories that you um, will find between the covers of, of, of braiding sweetgrass are each one of them a braiding of science, of indigenous philosophy, of, um, of the knowledge of the plants, and certainly my own um, journey over this lifetime of, of, of being a, a, a humble student of, of, of plants and things that I have learned along the way. And, uh, you know, being privileged to quite literally sit at the feet of, of, of plants um, for most of my life, it felt important to share those stories with the wider audience. Hence, braiding sweetgrass. Thank you so much. I, and, and again, like uh, those are, those are all of the things that we're going to, we're going to talk about and, and dig into that a little bit more. Um, and, and that's so much of the reason why, you know, this, you know, getting to this, this conversation is it's part of our, our winter reading challenge. Right. And so we had this idea to do around the world in 80 days and when we're putting together something like that, and um, it's such a, a vast topic and it, and it occurred to me what we were leaving out all together, you know, it's this entire other layer of, or this other strand of, of cultures and people, nations, value systems um, that are not traditionally or, or, or rarely acknowledged um, in, in, in these lines and boundaries on our planet or our stories. Um, yet that is so much of what what sweet braiding sweetgrass is it's marrying these two worlds of, of traditional studies and, and like you said botany biology um, and indigenous knowledge and teachings and, and that's powerful that's that's a powerful lens for the world um, and so let's start there can you can you talk more about this lens of the world and and how and bringing these two things together yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm so glad you're using that that metaphor of the lens when you're thinking about this notion of around the world in, did you say 80 days, 80 books, yeah. <laughs> in the winter, whatever, um, yeah. that notion that we have to go somewhere else to find um, profoundly meaningful, rich cultures. Um, in Colorado, you are on what Ute and Shoshone lands, is that right? Yes. yes. Um, right, 
right where you are, rich teachings, which our painful history has sought to erase. So we do need another lens, right? Because, because the history of colonialism has sought to erase them. And that too is part of the work of braiding sweetgrass is to say, look, look, um, look what is here. Um, this, this rich intellectual uh, tradition um, for caring for each other and, and for the planet. And the thinking about it as a lens is because we are inevitably, because um, most Americans are embedded in the Western worldview, we're really unaware that there is a whole nother worldview by which we could view the land and, and the earth and, and our relationships to it. And that's what I wanna do in Braiding Sweetgrass is to say, you know, there is this lens which um, is colored by really different values and assumptions about what what land is like this. When you, when you think about a lens on land, um, the Western lens sees land as property, right? Almost synonymous with property for which we say we have rights to this property. Um, sometimes we think about land in the Western lens as natural resources as well, land as capital, um, and land as providing for us water and soil and food and little things like oxygen. Um, through And so through the Western lens, that's how we see land. But if you have the lens of indigenous ways of knowing, you look at land and um, it's so much bigger than that. It's not land as property, um, not land as the place for which you claim rights, but land as the place for which you have a moral responsibility. Um, uh, because the land is sacred, because the land is our library, it's our teacher, um, it's our healer, it's our pharmacy. It's not only our home, but the home of our more than human relatives. It's the place where time between our ancestors and our descendants and us standing right at that pivot point between them, that all happens on land. Those are all the different meanings of land that come when we look at, at the world through the indigenous lens. Um, land not as object, land not as a thing, but land as, as, as a living being. Um, and the whole world changes if you look through that other lens. And, and I, it seems like it would be impossible for these two, I, I want to say competing, even though that might not be the right word, um, of, of communication and, and thoughts of, and value systems looking at land, not as property. And that creates these, these misreads in, in communication and intentions with each other in our natural world. Um, and it seems like some of those have really important consequences. They certainly do. Um, any number of contemporary issues in, in, associated with land in this country and energy and water and wildlife, all those things we care about, um, are, are colored by the Western lens. But if you look at things like salmon restoration in the Pacific Northwest, forest management in the, in the Great Lakes and the Great Pinelands, um, river restoration in, in Oregon. Um, I'm sure there are um, examples in Colorado that I don't know about um, and uh, am eager to learn. Um, and these conflicts, I guess we'll call them, take Oak Flats in Arizona right now. Should it be a mine or it's a sacred site? Um, that is a product of looking at the world through two different lenses. Um, can it be sacred and a suitable site for development by a multinational um, or company? Um, how do we reconcile those two things? And the important thing is to recognize that there are multiple stories at play here. And we as human people have a choice about what story we want to embrace. Is the land capital and property? Is it just stuff that's here for us to use and consume and either care for or wreck? Doesn't matter because it's just stuff. 
Or is it our home, our library, our healer, our sacred place? Um, and we all have a choice about how we view that. And so that's part of the power of realizing that there's another lens. You don't have to, you don't have to stick with the one that you've got. <laughs> And we're all better for it, you know, learning those different things. And yeah, I want to, I want to circle back to that because that's a really big topic here, especially in Colorado and especially in our area specifically. Um, but before we get to that, I want to, I'm wondering what, what it was like entering into your studies at, at the beginning and, and reconciling these two things that you were trying to put together, you know, the, your, your, your indigenous knowledge, and then also this very developed field of, of biology and botany. Yeah, yeah. Um, both rich knowledges in, in their own way, and in a way, um, not in conversation with one another. And in fact, because of the way most of our, particularly our science education is conducted, there's been erasure of indigenous science. Um, it's all dismissed as folklore or stories or, and, and not really taken seriously as, as, as science. And I'm really glad you asked about this early entry for me, because it's a story that really shapes who I am as a scientist, as a writer, and as, as, as a citizen. Um, and that is, I was not raised on our reservation, but I was raised with Potawatomi values and I was raised on the land. I knew land was my teacher and that the plants were my companions and my elders. Um, no question about that. And uh, when I was a People always ask me, well, when did you get interested in botany? And I have to sort of give that answer like, yeah, I can't remember a time when I wasn't. Um, it's, it's just part of who I am. So I went away to, to college to study botany. And um, that for me was that first understanding of the different lenses. Um, because the way that I thought about plants, I was told pretty much flat out was not welcome at the university. I was told, well, no, 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 that's <laughs> not science. <laughs> Everything that I knew about plants from the plants, um, I was told was, you know, no, no. Um, and, but, you know, I was a, a young person without a vocabulary of resistance. I thought I was wrong. I thought I must have made a really big mistake. And so I entered the university and learned botany the way um, they thought it was. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. You know, the, the cultural disjunct um, I weathered because I loved plants. I wanted to know everything about them, even knowing that it was through this different lens. Um, and so in a way, uh, Western scientific ways of thinking um, worked hard to colonize my, my indigenous way of thinking. And it was after I'd gotten my PhD in botany that um, wonderful teachers reemerged into my life um, to help me remember what I had been asked to leave behind. And um, it was, uh, it was powerful. And it, it's, it's a, they say as writers, you know, we're always going to be in some way writing our life story. And I know that that's true because my first day at the university was not so different than my grandfather's first day of so-called education because he was one of the lost generation. He, at nine years old, was taken from his family in, uh, in our reservation in Oklahoma, put on a train for the Carlisle Indian School, whose mission was to kill the Indian to save the man. He experienced brainwashing, right? Um, to say the least, um, from the first. And that's not unlike what I experienced two generations later. Um, so I'm really happy to tell you, and thank you for mentioning it in your introduction, that right down the hall from where I was told that what I knew didn't matter and needed to be replaced by scientific botany, um, we now have the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, um, whose goal is to use both of these not one or the other, but both of them, um, because both of these lenses 
we can see more. We can see more truths about the world when we, when we have binocular vision rather than monocular vision. And, and your writing is, is such, a, it, it, it proves it. It, it just, it, it's seamless. You know, it, it's, it seems impossible that these things could have ever been separate. Um, and, and this comes together as, as literary biology. And I'm, I'm interested in your approach to writing literary biology. You know, it seems, I hear this often, you know, about nature writing. Uh, how many times can you describe a tree or, you know, and, and I can't relate, but it's, it's, it's interesting. So, so yeah, your, your approach to, to writing that and, and dis- defining your writing as that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that within sort of the, that notion of, of, of being a nature writer, there's so many manifestations of, of what it is to be a nature writer. That's why I think a little bit more about literary biology, because I really want for my readers the experience that I now as an elder still have those magic words of look, look, Um, you know, when you're out in the woods with a kid, right? And they look, look at that. And I've never lost that. I'm always look, look. And that's what I want for my readers. I want to go on a field trip together and, and um, uh, reintroduce, I guess, re-engage wonder and amazement. Um, So that notion of how can, could you describe a tree? <laughs> what would you say? What, it's like you've seen one, you've seen them all, really? I, I, I guess. I, I can't <laughs> relate. I, I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> right. As a botanist, obviously, I have to like, <laughs> well, no. <laughs> That's like saying you've seen one human, so therefore you don't have to differentiate between Lacey and Robin. Um, <laughs> Because it's all just human, um, you know, yeah, that's craziness. So it is literary biology in that it also is a way of cultivating attention. Um, and we live in a society where our attention, which is such a precious gift that we have, um, is being hijacked, right? It is being hijacked by advertisements and high tech devices and saying, pay attention to me, pay attention to me when the things that have always sustained us, both from the natural world and in relationships with one another, we're asked to disregard and not spend our attention on on cultivating relationship with each other or with the more than human world. And so to me, literary biology is also about cultivating attention. And uh, I'm not the first to say that science is a way of paying attention, right? Obviously, but so is art. Art is a way of paying attention. And of course, the great Mary Oliver, the wonderful poet, what was her line of, I don't know much about prayer, but I do know how to pay attention. Um, So spirituality as a way of, 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 paying attention and voila, all those ways of paying attention in the braid of sweetgrass, in those, that braiding of those ways, yeah. You, you also talk about, um, you call it the animacy of grammar. And what's so fascinating about that is that just by using the language and as, using language in a specific way, you know, instead of calling a flower it and, and giving it like a they and, and thinking of it in a different way, it changes our perception. It changes how we how we see that very thing. It's an, it's 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 impossible not to. Um, can you talk some more about that? Yes, and Lacey, it goes right back to your opening question about a lens, right? In English, if you think about it, um, we call all things in nature it, right? In English, we have no way around that. But I would never call you it. <laughs> because it would be disrespectful, right? It would, it would, it would be deeply disrespectful and rude, and and so. Um, but we we're 
It's the only thing English gives us to say about that flower, that bird. But in the Potawatomi language and in other languages as well, um, we speak a grammar of animacy so that we can't say of that sugar maple, we can't call it it. See, English made us call it it. <laughs> um, but you can't do that in Potawatomi. We use the same grammar for birds and rivers and, and trees as we do for each other because we pay respect of personhood to all beings. Boy, there's a really different lens, right? Yes. Our, our trees and, and land and rivers and birds beings, or are they things? Are they our relatives or are they natural resources? And depending on what lens you look through, Obviously, that shapes our, our, our thoughts and our behaviors. If the world is made up of its, it's, it, it's a kind of permission for the exploitative worldview in which we find ourselves. Um, if the world is made of its, then, um, well, it's, it's a just copper. Let's just rip up sacred mountains to get it out of the ground. But if the land is is full of our more than human relatives, if the land is alive, that's unthinkable, right? Um, so it's all about the worldview. And we've been pretty much told that the Western worldview is the only one, at least the only one that matters. And that's part of the medicine of braiding sweetgrass is just to say, you know, there are other ways to think. Absolutely, thank you. Um, you know, thinking about that we're, we're almost a year into this COVID-19 pandemic and, and in Colorado, it's been really clear, you know, there's been a resurgence of people wanting to get out into nature and, and be, and just get out there. And, and, but it, it feels different. It, it doesn't feel natural or organic, you know, um, and, and, and it's impossible to think about like, if it's, if this is actually a sign of a changing relationship, um, like a genuine return of people remembering that, you know, that wow that you were talking about as, as children, um, or if this is, you know, a flash in a pan and, and something that we're just going through right now. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's very personal to Colorado for sure. It's been interesting yeah. to watch. Yeah, um, same is true here. Many of my favorite trails and paddle places where, you know, I almost always had them to myself. Now it's me and a hundred of my closest friends. <laughs> um, but how powerful is that? Um, I think that this time of the pandemic has really been a time of values clarification for a lot of people to say, well, what is it that really matters? When things are, let's say, taken away from you, when our lives become restricted, we sort of distill what are our real sources of meaning and relationship and pleasure? What are the things that are keeping us afloat? Doesn't every conversation these days begin with that? Like, how are you holding up? What, what are you doing that is making you still feel whole and sane and in relationship. And so many people have found that in, in the outdoors. Um, and uh, I, it's also true that many of the folks who are flocking to, to wild places are, are real beginners who are coming to use those places without, shall we say, a well-developed sense of responsibility for <laughs> those places, uh, to put it, mildly. Um, so that has to be part of it too, um, is that when we embrace these gifts of being out in the natural world, gifts don't come without responsibilities attached to them. Um, so I, I'm hoping that, that um, when we think about the, the ways that we are changed, the things that we are remembering because of the ways our lives have changed. Simplicity um, is being reinforced and these essential values of, of, of what really is keeping us alive, the natural world. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and you know, going back to that, like, you know, you were saying that 
you're also on the trail with a hundred of your closest friends uh, across the country. Um, and, and you talk about this a little bit in Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, you know, I, Colorado has been going through that for quite some time, you know, exponential population growth. You also talk about, you know, just old, old mining sites. There's just, there's so many similarities here. And um, it's, it just feels like it's, it's becoming more and more impossible to not talk about nature without also mentioning our, our human impact on that. And, and here you can see this palpable social dilemma of our communities, you know, do we, is it, is it our job to protect these spaces for generations to come? Or is it our job to, to, to maintain that access at all costs to these sacred spaces? Well, I, I, I can't answer that question for anyone. <laughs> um, Dave, to say, what are the lenses on land and uses that allow the land to continue giving to us into the future. Um, and whether you live in, in rural Colorado, rural upstate New York, or in the heart of a city, we can't just look at the gifts of the earth without also looking at the wounds that we have inflicted and ecological compassion extends not only to the places that we treasure because they're pristine, but to remember that other places were pristine too. Um, but by the lens that we chose to think about land as stuff, as property, as opposed to a home of living beings, including ourselves, we're bearing the consequences of those, of those choices. And I think that you know, this is what the great philosopher Joanna Macy called the time of the great turning, that we are in a time of, of cultural transformation, of turning away from exploitative worldviews, which are a dead end, you know, they are a dead end. I'm an ecologist, you know, <laughs> you know, it's a dead end. <laughs> Wrecking your we'll plan. Work for it. <laughs> and it's a dead end. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's just common sense. Everybody knows that. Um, and so the question is, how do we live in a way that supports regenerative economies? It doesn't mean don't take. Of course not. We can't photosynthesize. We have to take from the land, but we could take honorably. We could take in a way that regenerates soil. We could take in a way that regenerates clean water, not destroys it. Um, and that is the challenge of this time that Joanna Macy talks about is this, this turning away from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, because that's the only way that we're going to persist on the planet. Yeah, thank you. So thinking about the, you know, people go out into nature and, and you know, we're, we're talking about these connections and, and, and also this disconnect between our, our lenses, our, our languages, how we describe these things. But what I think is fascinating was that there's also this very powerful, very real biological, physiological connection as us, us as humans have with the natural world. Um, and I, I was thinking of um, asters and, and goldenrods and, and how those two things come together. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little more. Yeah, um, where to begin? Um, asters and goldenrod are, I suspect you have them too. I know you do. Um, um, but I will say that back here in the moist hills of the, of the, of the East, they are a spectacular spectacular blanket of gold and 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 purple um, and they are plants that have always meant a great deal to me because of the stunning beauty of them growing together and around here anyway they do grow side by side um, not a patch of gold over there and a patch of purple over here but intermingled um, and as a result they are they are simply stunning and so I, I use them to think about complementarity they're complementary colors right that's why they look so awesome to us yes. um, but what could we create more 
beauty in the ways that we live if we had complementarity between these worldviews. Um, to have the lens of, of the indigenous organic worldview of the world as, as, as a sacred place full of beings. And can we also use the power of, of, of scientific tools to help care for the earth? We can do both of those. They can be goldenrod and asters um, to each other, not standing on opposite sides of, of the field. And in the case of indigenous knowledge, um, you know, let's be honest, people try to make that kind of knowledge go extinct because it stood in the way of, of conquest and exploitation. Um, but now is the time to bring them back together again. Um, and I think that's really our work. The theme of the book is that reciprocity, that complementarity of how do we um, come back into this complementary or reciprocal relationship with the earth, not just being takers all the time, but being givers as, as well. To think of ourselves as givers, not just as uh, consumers. Yes, thank you, absolutely. Um, yeah, going with um, you know, specific places and um, you, know, you talk about this concept of being indigenous to place. Um, and how, you know, I would, I would go there and I, I would just say, hey, those are really pretty purple and yellow flowers side by side. I, I wouldn't have as much of a perspective on them and, and what, what that means in that area. And, and yeah, um, can you talk more about being indigenous to place? And, and, and you describe this as, as honoring the land and caring for its keepers. Um, what, what does that mean to you and, and to all of us? Yeah, um, to connect it back to the goldenrod and asters, I think it's what you said, Lacey, is really important. You would just look at them and say, there's some pretty flowers. Um, <laughs> fine, <laughs> that, that's, that's a good beginning place. Um, and I, because I have this botanical mind, I can't go there. <laughs> I don't know what that would be like. like yeah. What? <laughs> um, well, maybe like going into a, I don't know, clothing store or something say, oh, well, those things look nice together. I, I have no idea what they are, but, <laughs> um, but being indigenous to place requires that you're in relationship and it requires that you know who your neighbors are. Um, you know, it's, you don't have to know the technical names of goldenrod and asters, but you need to pay attention to them um, and pay attention to your pollinators and your birds and, and your trees and your, and your water quality. We're back to attention again, because if you think about within a human community, if you choose not to know the names of your neighbors, are you going to be able to borrow that proverbial cup of sugar from your neighbors if you don't even know who they are? Of course not. Are you gonna be able to help them or them help you when your car's in the ditch? No, you're a stranger to them. If you don't even know who they are. We know that in human communities, the same is true in the more than human communities. We have to know each other. Um, and, and our grandparents did, you know, our, they knew all the birds and plants and, 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 and trees and wildlife and knew what they needed and where they lived and what their names were. Um, and that certainly um, the deep knowledge of indigenous knowledge is paying attention so that you can be in mutual aid societies. In the pandemic, did your communities create mutual aid societies to help each other? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. It, it, and just like you said, it's, it's necessary. It becomes a necessity. It, it, it's, it, it's not really even a choice almost, you know? <laughs> right. Right. We know how to do this yes. and being indigenous to place means we, we take what we know how to do with each other and do it with the more than human people as well. Do it with the birds and the soil and the fish. Um, that's part of becoming indigenous to place, that web of relationships. But it's more than that. It's also um, really having that sense of responsibility for one another. Just like you wouldn't drive by your neighbor stuck in the ditch, you shouldn't drive by your neighbor, you know, birds who are going to be poisoned by that agricultural pesticide. 
Mm. To, to me, that is the same thing as driving by your neighbor in a ditch. No, it isn't. It's not the same. It's more like driving your neighbor into the ditch. Do you, so do you think it's, it, we're losing our ability to, or to really become indigenous to place because movement is just so natural and almost expected in our society. I, you know, I'm, I'm not from Colorado. I, you know, I feel lucky and grateful enough to be here. Um, but how does that, yeah. How does that work in, in those two things together? Staying home helps. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true that we have created a very transient society where um, our allegiances are, are not to the, to the land and the life systems that are under our feet in many cases. Um, and um, that undermines our ability to care for our places and to know that our places are caring for us as well. Um, so, um, you know, I've, I wonder, and I've heard from many actually, that that's one of the um, outcomes of the isolation of the pandemic as well. People are saying, granted, you know, they're saying it to me, so it's a, a filter and a lens. <laughs> They've said, I've fallen in love with my home place. I've realized what really keeps me going is my home place. I care about this place because I've had to slow down. I've had to pay attention. I've had to invest in relationships. And, and I've, as a result, I've fallen in love with my home. And I'm making it a home, not just the place that I live. And that's what the word indigenous means, right? It's you are of this place. It doesn't mean you're just passing through. It doesn't mean you're a colonist coming in and taking what you can get and leaving the mess behind and moving on to the next place. Mm. That's, that's, that's the colonizer mentality. And this book is an invitation to an indigenous, indigenous mentality to live as if the, this place held your life, which it does. Um, as to live as if this will be the home of your grandchildren. Um, yeah. And as you'll, as you'll know, as through the book, I really wrestled with that term of becoming indigenous to place because of its very particular meaning for indigenous people. And as a botanist, we, we talk about native plants, right? We talk about non-native plants. Um, and in between, we have a category that we call naturalized species, species that aren't from here, but have come and fit in and live respectfully, have become part of the ecosystem um, in a way that, that hasn't um, uh, damaged the ecosystem. So really, by the end of the book, I'm talking about that notion of an invitation for the colonist to become a naturalized citizen of the place, to, to treat the earth that we live on as if it were our one home, because it is. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it seems so simple, right? <laughs> um, <this> yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, I just want to pause for a minute and, um, tell everybody that's listening. Uh, we have about, uh, 10 more, seven or eight more minutes, um, until we'll do a Q and A. So if you've been listening and if you had any questions or thoughts and you want to get those to Alex and, and he'll, uh, start getting those together for us. Um, okay. So I, I want to talk about one more part of your life. Um, you're, you're a professor and a teacher. Um, and you know, I, you talk about some of your classroom experiences and by classroom, um, <laughs> that's a very, a very broad, uh, setting. Um, you, a, your classroom was also a, a wigwam, um, and mucking through swamps for quite some time too. Um, is there, is there a particular experience or, or, or lesson that you've had with your students, whether as you are the teacher, but you as the student, um, that you, I don't know, that really, you really thought we got this. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you for bringing that up. I, I do, of course, teach in the classroom in the lab too, but my favorite, and I think the most effective teaching is when I get out of the way and just let the land be the teacher, the land and experience be the teacher. Um, and I, the, the students I teach are um, not unlike myself at their age, you know, really in love with the world, willing to engage and, um, you know, 
be in the in the world. But I think teaching the students on that that field trip where I take them every year to go wading in a cattail marsh. Um, which they're reluctant to do, you know, wading waist deep in muck, you know, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a certain challenge. <laughs> and I, I, I love just kind of watching it all unfold. Um, but before long, they realize that everything that they need to survive is in that cattail marsh. Um, there's all kinds of food, there's shelter, there's clothing, there's fire starter, there's insulation, there's medicine, there's bug repellent, everything that you need to live in that biome is in that marsh. And really the only way that you, they start to learn that is by gathering and by making and um, it's such a natural and powerful way to learn of engaging with the earth. And it's not the way most of our classrooms are, are structured. And I count that as a tremendous loss um, because we start to think that the person standing in front of us is the teacher. No, it's experience, it's the living world who is the teacher and I urge people to maybe, you know, maybe wading into the cattail marsh isn't a good way to begin. Um, but it is a full immersion experience, but you could start by foraging, simple foraging, the, you know, eating your lawn um, or um, creating a lawn that you can eat. You don't have to create it. The land creates it all by, by herself. Um, you just have to pay attention and know what's edible and what's medicinal. And how much fun is that? Um, I guess, you know, like, like most people, I think if it isn't fun, it's not really worth doing. That's not entirely true. There are plenty of things that aren't fun that we have to do, but the more fun, the better. And engagement with the living world, you know, teaching in, in a wigwam that we have collectively made, teaching in a, a swamp, um, it's, it's marvelous. And there are those moments when I, I think about um, taking those same students out on the trail for the first day and and I, I, we came upon a big patch of wintergreen so of course I picked it up and put it in my mouth and the students just looked at me like you're gonna eat that plant off the ground and I'm like where do you think food comes from <laughs> um, and and that moment of shock on their faces she's going to eat something off the ground well of course she is and within a moment, they're saying, oh, I want to do that too. I want to do that too. And once you start being fed by the land, you are a different person. Um, when, when you come to Carbondale, you can walk around and eat the edible flowers on Main Street and, and get equally awkward looks from people. <laughs> awesome. Is this the first of experience, Lacey? <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting for sure. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, we, we all have so much to learn and, and your writing and, and reading Sweetgrass is an incredible place to start. Um, and thank you for that. Um, so for those of you listening, if you haven't read Braiding Sweetgrass, um, you'll have the luck of finding all of these themes and, and words interwoven throughout the entire book. Um, and it just blends so seamlessly. Um, thank you so much for talking about your teaching experience. Um, so I wanted to um, ask you if any more thoughts before we, we dive into a Q&A. We have about nine or nine minutes or so left and we'll get to some questions. I'd love to hear what's on people's mind. Great. Let's see what we got here. Um, uh, do you have any daily practice or ritual that helps to nurture your connection with place? You know, what keeps your heart full? Mm, I do. I do. Um, I, I am outside every day um, for sure. Um, and I have a gratitude practice that um, I go outside and really, you know, look around and create this sense of gratitude of, wow, that air tastes good. Um, oh, I'm so glad to see these trees again. I'm glad to hear those birds. Um, how beautiful those 
clouds look, how good it is to be strong enough to stand up on the land. Um, and um, all, of, all of those gratitudes um, make me feel really rich. They make me feel like I have everything that I need. And especially in a time when many of us feel like so much is being taken from us, remembering that how much is given to us is a whole different orientation to the world that does, as you say, fills me up, fills me up. Um, and out of that fullness, you have more to give. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, do you think this, in, this indigenous principle is, is why we tend to feel a yearning for the land that we came from? So thinking about how a lot of us, you know, if we've moved away um, and, and even if we're happy here, it's, I mean, if, if you're having a bad time in Colorado, you're not doing it right. Um, we're so happy here being present, but do you think that that's why we feel that yearning uh, to return to where we're from? It's, it's hard to say that that natal landscape phenomenon is real. You know, many people yes. will go back home like, oh, this feels good. I feel like a salmon. I've just swum upstream. You know, I knew where I needed to be. Um, although that's not always the place that we that we choose to 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 live either. Um, um, in fact, you know, I visit Colorado often. I love Colorado. Um, and my family who live there say, oh, you should come live here. I think mm, I will come visit here often. <laughs> but no, I know where I belong, you know. Um, uh, so that, that sense of home is, is profound. Well, I think what I would respond to in this, in this question is to affirm a sense of longing we do have a longing and interestingly, I love how words work. The longing we have is for belonging. We I love want, that. Yeah. yeah. You talk yeah. about that in, in the book too, this great longing is upon us. Um, yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, yeah. I wanna get to this other question. I think it's pretty interesting. So, um, how do you see a uh, unified uh, quantum science uh, shifting the paradigm or worldview so we can open our minds and hearts to the interconnectedness and oneness of, of all that is creation and, and Mother Earth? Well, I'm not sure exactly what the, the uh, questioner is asking about in terms of unified quantum theory, but it is true that we are all made of the same stuff, that we are all exchanging energy and matter with all other living beings. Um, the notion that, that I am an individual just makes me laugh because <laughs> You know, when I, if you did a count of the cells that are me, um, um, a, a fraction of them are human <laughs> cells. You know, I have more prokaryotic cells than I do my own eukaryotic cells. You know, these, um, I'm inhabited by all of these beings. The air that I breathe was given to me by plants. Um, you know, I am made out of the rocks that I stand on. Um, no, there's, I don't, I just, this notion that we are somehow separate beings is, is a biological fallacy. Um, and I think it's also a spiritual fallacy. You know, it's there is really we. There's there is we. Um, and um, the more we can think about our fundamental interconnectedness, the easier it is for ecological compassion and human compassion to flourish when we recognize that we're all the same. Great, thank you. We have one last question. Um, so you describe yourself as many things, uh, mother, professor, scientist, botanist, all of, what, if, there, if you could put one as first or what, what would that be and why? Mm. Hmm. Hmm. 
Well, I don't think I would choose any of those things on that on that list, I guess, um, because they are kind of little compartments, aren't they? But they're compartments of relationships. So I, I think of myself as you know as a as a grateful human, um, as as a as a bimadisi um, aki in our language, an earth being. I am a grateful, grateful earth being, and and sometimes my work and my passions are involved in mothering and writing and sciencing and gardening and all of those things. But fundamentally, I am a grateful earthling. Great. Thank you. Um, those are all the questions we have. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you, Dr. Kimmer, for being here. I This has been a lovely conversation. Um, so many important, we could all of these separate topics could be conversations in and of themselves. Um, so, so thank you. I really appreciate you being here. Um, and thank you everyone to coming for coming. Um, how about, yeah. Thank you everybody. This is always a pleasure. And Lacey, what a good conversation. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your, for your thoughtfulness and uh, um, be well everybody and good night. Good night everyone. <laughs>